I know the right people and I know the system and, and I went to the ball game with the president. In other words, there were three of us, me, Tip, and, and that's it. So I've got as much influence and I know as much about the goddamn workings as any. You're not going to have any trouble. July 1978, when it all started. Originally, the FBI set out on a mission to catch New York City underworld scammers dealing stolen artwork and goods. Rumors were spreading of such activity around the city, and the FBI, after learning new details from their informants within key mafia and criminal organization ranks, decided it was go time. It was time to shut these operations down. So a team was formed, led by Agent John Good, and they decided to infiltrate these schemes through deception, through a sting. Specifically, they wanted to seem like legitimate, wealthy foreign buyers to build trust with and lure said criminals with their riches to lower their guard, attempting to buy a couple of their merchandise before pulling the rug on them and taking them down. Thus, through a couple hours of brainstorming amongst the team, the FBI came up with their cover. They went out and set up a bogus company in Long Island by the name Abdul Enterprises, said to be owned by a wealthy Arab sheik, Kambir Abdul Rahman, a completely made up, fictitious person who wished to invest his oil money in valuable artworks and he did not care where it came from. Additionally, the FBI, specifically Agent John Good, enlisted Melvin Weinberg into his ranks, a former con artist who had his fun earning half a million to a million dollars per year, running numerous scams and rackets, such as insurance and investment fraud, and flying across the world, living a life of luxury, splitting his time between his wife and side piece to aid in the recovery of these stolen paintings, since he knew all about that world. In return, Weinberg, who was facing a three plus year prison sentence after having been convicted of running a fraudulent real estate scheme, saw his sentence reduced to probation as well as received the opportunity to earn bounties for each case he helped uncover after agreeing to help the FBI by posing as the US representative and president of Abdul Enterprises. What better way to infiltrate and shut down a criminal operation than with a con artist who knows that world inside out and has a reputation in it. To add on, the FBI special agents assigned to the case also took on aliases and corporate titles, including undercover operative Anthony Amoroso, who became Tony DeVito, serving as Abdul's personal construction engineer. A bank was also recruited to vouch for Sheikh Rahman's wealth. A Long Island office was opened as the corporate headquarters, and even a second Sheikh, Yasir Habib, was later introduced when the FBI brought in an agent of Lebanese descent to play him. This was their cover. All that was left now was to connect with the dealers, to get into one of their auctions, pull the rug on them, and boom, this thing was a success. To do this, the FBI used Weinberg and his knowledge and reputation as a con artist to see who they could hook, what leads they could get, and thus began Operation Abscam. Now, for some time, Weinberg and the FBI team uncovered mostly small-time junk as they scoured the New York City criminal underworld. Advanced fee scams, stolen securities, fraudulent certificates of deposit, you know, small-time scammers, but as they jumped from one scammer to another, they got closer and closer to the big fish. They moved up the chain as after word started to spread around that there was a royal sheik in town who wanted to invest oil money into valuable artworks, the crew started to get gestured towards some people who could provide such artwork. A black market auction, just what they were looking for. So 
The crew pulled up to the auction once they were given the location, but this time without their disguises, and they blew it up. They arrested several individuals dealing in stolen art and recovered two 17th century paintings missing since 1966, estimated to be worth more than $1 million. This was a huge find and success for the team as they were a small, minimally funded operation, and from there, they realized that they could keep this going since their sting operation was masterfully structured and still intact. Their cover was not blown, so why stop now? As a result, for nearly a year, the agents made numerous racketeering and fraud cases, all the while keeping Weinberg's role as informant a secret and while maintaining their cover. And through the course of that year, they uncovered $600 million worth of scams and fraud within the New York, New Jersey area. Fraudulent stocks, bonds, artwork, certificates of deposit, etc. This small time operation was turning into a humongous success for the FBI. But there soon came a turning point, a climax in this investigation because the more scams and schemes they uncovered, the deeper into the underbelly of the criminal underworld they went. To specify, at one of the later black market auctions, as Weinberg, who became a familiar face in the room as the rich oil man's US rep, did his thing and spun tales of these untapped oil riches that needed to be spent, a number of shady individuals saw opportunity, and all of a sudden, a growing circle of middlemen, fraudsters, and white collar criminals approached him offering their products and services. However, one man in particular stood out from the crowd, a convicted swindler by the name William Rosenberg, who had already done time for stock fraud, approached Weinberg with a lucrative deal involving the port of Camden and the city's dapper mayor, Angelo Ericetti, who Rosenberg implied was in on the take. Ericetti, also a prominent state senator and a major Democratic power broker, wielded considerable influence in South Jersey, as he was said to have connections with state regulators overseeing the casino boom of Atlantic City, where all development was contingent on the awarding of the beloved gaming license. Therefore, once Weinberg and Rosenberg's conversation advanced into the logistics of this Camden deal, Weinberg's eyes shot wide open as he realized just how big of an operation this was. This was not no small time local scammer, this was now the big leagues. What did I just come across? Weinberg thought to himself, and immediately, knowing how big his bounty would be if he got this case, Weinberg arranged a meeting with Mayor Ericetti and himself, and on December 1st, 1978, the mayor arrived at the Long Island office of Abdul Enterprises, where John Good and Mel Weinberg waited, still upholding their fake aliases, and of course, the entire office was bugged with a plethora of FBI wiretaps and cameras that overheard and oversaw the entire meeting. As a result, according to the surveillance tapes of the meeting, Ericetti was overheard defiantly stating, quote, I'll give you Atlantic City. Without me, you do nothing. That entire meeting consisted of the mayor claiming the magnitude of his influence with the state's Casino Control Commission and its vice chairman and good friend Kenneth N. MacDonald. The sheer thought of oil money within his grasp got him jumping up and down, exposing his insane corruption for all to hear, as according to Weinberg and Good, he was a ruthless crook who had no fear, and this meeting was where Ericetti made his offer, $25,000 up front right now, $400,000 total payment, and Abdul Enterprises, a completely fake, made-up company, will be guaranteed to get a casino gaming license. 
Ericetti was caught red-handed on camera. They got him. So good and Weinberg with a big smile across both of their faces gave him the $25,000 in cash and Ericetti grabbed it and danced away thinking he just struck gold. But soon after, with the clear-cut evidence exposing his corrupt schemes, Ericetti was arrested and charged before he could even deposit the money into his bank account. However, folks, we're not done just yet because the success of this team in exposing Ericetti shifted Abscam from the small operation that sought to uncover local scams into a major political corruption investigation that used the mayor as the critical go-between to capture even bigger fish that ran all the way to Capitol Hill. As at one meeting with Weinberg, Good, and the other agents, Ericetti, who became the FBI's rat in an attempt to seek a lesser sentence, said he knew congressmen willing to take bribes, where the names of Raymond F. Letterer and Michael Myers, both of Philadelphia, would later come up. And from there, once Ericetti loosened up a bit, the list quickly grew. Representative Frank Thompson Jr. of Trenton, who served as chairman of the powerful House Administration Committee. Democratic Congressman John M. Murphy of Staten Island, John Jenrett of South Carolina, along with Republican Richard Kelly of Florida, and even Senator Harrison A. Williams of New Jersey. With this enticing list of potential marks, the FBI were now arranging a number of meetings at airports and rented Washington homes, in Atlantic City hotel rooms, offices in Long Island and in Florida. They arranged for chartered jets, limos, and parties. The team later on even acquired a yacht seized by US Customs in a drug bust and fitted it with video and audio surveillance gear that could pick up and record conversations anywhere on board to hold parties with politicians. All this was done to expose and uncover the schemes of each and every politician on that list. Now, the script for each sting operation was relatively the same. For example, when Letterer, a Democrat from Philadelphia, knocked on the door of room 717 of the Hilton Inn at Kennedy International Airport on a Tuesday evening, Ericetti was there, waiting for him with Weinberg, Good, and other undercover FBI agents posing as representatives of the fictitious royal sheik. The meeting was secretly videotaped and it was explained that the sheik was looking for a sponsor in case he needed help getting into the country one day, and Letterer, without hesitation, offered to pass a quote, private bill for the sheik to do just that. Later that night, the congressman left the hotel with a brown bag containing $50,000 in cash for his services. The evidence against him was indefensible. Similarly, Michael Ozzie Myers, a former longshoreman, was given the same rundown where he was recorded on videotape, saying, quote, I'm gonna tell you something real simple and short. The money talks in this business and bullshit talks. It works the same way down in Washington. Shortly after, he too left with $50,000 in a brown bag. One by one, down the list, Good and Weinberg went, mounting clear-cut, incriminating evidence against each public official on that list. However, the team still had yet to capture the biggest fish of them all, Senator Harrison A. Williams, a longtime member of Congress who served more than two decades in the U.S. Senate. Williams was a liberal Democrat known as a tough legislator and champion of organized labor and social welfare programs who authored federal laws protecting pension rights and the first law providing mass transportation assistance to states. Williams also served as a Navy pilot in World War II. On the surface, he was a proud, honorable, patriotic man who loved and supported his fellow Americans. But of course, when they dug deeper, the FBI had learned that Williams may not be the Mr. Nice Guy he was propped up to be, as he had a hidden interest in a titanium mining venture in Piney River, Virginia. Therefore, when close associates of the senator were informed that Sheikh Habib, who was a very popular man in DC during this time for his willingness to pay large upfront bribes, was willing to lend $100 million in exchange for using Williams's influence 
to obtain government contracts for the mine's output, Williams' eyes exploded with dollar signs as a meeting was immediately scheduled with the royal Arab sheik himself, aka Richard Farhart, an FBI agent brought in from the Ohio office wearing an Arab headdress and a suit and who said very little during his meetings with Williams. In contrast though, Williams did not shy away from speaking as this was an extremely lucrative opportunity in his eyes and he was not going to let it go as the hidden cameras and wiretaps caught him turning to the sheik and exclaiming quote, if this can be put together in my position within the government here, which goes back decades, and knowing as I do the people that make the decisions, when we've got it together, we move. To add on, in another meeting at the Plaza Hotel in New York, Williams also assured the Sheik he would help him gain permanent residency, and Farhart, pretending to have difficulty speaking English, offered Williams money for this promised help. But the senator vehemently rejected the money and continued to press for the sheik's investment in the titanium deal when the cameras caught him explaining, my interest is with my associates to see this very valuable mining area appropriately developed. This was plentiful evidence to indict not only Williams, but also the dozens of other politicians caught up in this sting. They were all caught in broad daylight with their pants down. There was no million dollar super lawyer who could spin this story any other way. And by now, this operation and case grew so massive that it was being directed by the Justice Department's organized crime strike force in Brooklyn, headed by federal prosecutor Thomas P. Pucho. And this operation, Abscam, could have continued onwards, exposing more powerful officials if it wasn't for the internal conflict that eventually arose within the team. Specifically, the new directors put in place started to feel that Weinberg was quote, scamming the government officials trying to monitor the operation. After all, Weinberg was a manipulative con artist who conned people his whole life, so it wasn't too crazy to think that he may be conning the FBI. To explain, since Weinberg was getting a bounty for each case he made, he was found to be coaching the targets of the investigation before each meeting on what to say, suggesting specific language that would ensure an indictment. Specifically, he would tell each mark that there was an Arab way to do business, meaning they would be told to make themselves sound important because the sheik would be more willing to invest if he knew politicians were involved because according to Weinberg, that's how things got done in the Middle East. This was all done as a way to influence each mark, each target, to talk loud and proud about their dealings, which in turn would increase the total amount of incriminating evidence against them, which would then increase the number of cases under investigation, and thus increase Weinberg's total bounty. He was in it for the money after all. Now, this rubbed the FBI the wrong way. They felt like they were getting played because this act by Weinberg could have very well messed up the entire investigation if one of the defending lawyers spun the story in a way that made Weinberg again, a manipulative con artist, seem like he coerced each politician into incriminating themselves. This was dangerous territory that the FBI was treading on as this had the potential of screwing the entire case up and it pretty much slowed down Operation Abscam from then on. But what ultimately ended the operation for good was when Abscam became public in February of 1980 when details of the still ongoing investigation were leaked to the media because now their cover was blown wide open for everyone to see. No more secrecy. So that was the end of that and in the following months a grand jury was instated and all of the FBI videotapes, hours on top of hours of confidential, top secret conversations that exposed dozens of politicians and top officials were brought out onto the floor 
for everyone to watch and listen. And luckily for the FBI, the jury and judge didn't need much convincing as the evidence was blatant. Nothing the defense said could justify any of the obvious illegal actions caught on tape. Hence, Senator Williams, Representatives Thompson, Murphy, Myers, and Jenrit were indicted and in time, all were convicted, as were three Philadelphia councilmen, Ericetti, and several other political operatives with ties to Williams and Ericetti. Meanwhile, Letterer, convicted of conspiracy and bribery, served just 10 months in prison, and he was actually re-elected while under indictment, yet resigned from Congress the day after the House Ethics Committee voted to expel him. Furthermore, Richard Kelly, the only Republican nabbed in Abscam and who claimed he had accepted $25,000 in cash as part of his own investigation of corruption, was eventually convicted of bribery and conspiracy. But what's truly surprising from all of this is that out of every public official approached in this sting operation, only one person, one, declined the Sheik's lucrative upfront offer in exchange for a favor. Senator Larry Pressler, who actually, quite ironically, reported his meeting with the men to the FBI as he was suspicious. So I guess there was still some hope in DC after all. And finally, at the end of it all, after putting in his two years with the FBI in this operation, Mel Weinberg walked away with $150,000 cash. What was initially meant to be a simple, small-scale sting operation to shut down New York City scammers dealing stolen artwork and securities turned into a pivotal operation that shook up local East Coast politics as well as Washington DC as a whole since it targeted 31 public officials and obtained 19 total convictions on charges that included bribery, extortion, and conspiracy, just by pretending to be an oil-rich Arab sheik. In this world we live in, money, even if it's completely fake and made up, still talks, still rules the world.